humor is a divine antidote for the exaltation of ego and an automatic safety valve. But that vulgar and unkind expressions must not be confused with true spiritual humor, which is never cruel or blasphemous. High humor is divided into the categories of number one, reminiscent jests, two, current humor, and three, prophetic joy. We read that among the Andonic clans, humor was almost non-existent, 714. That little humor graced the early tribes of men, 748. That the apostle Nathaniel's humor was refreshing both to his associates in the kingdom and to the master himself, 1558. That the highest of our modern humor originates in our Adamic genetic stock, 835. And on page 1100, we read that true religion should not destroy one's sense of humor. Neither, I might add, can a sense of humor destroy one's true religion. Although to false religion, humor remains a most dreaded of adversaries. Humor punctures the pomposities of theological arrogance with an efficacy wondrous to behold. <laughs> there are many sentences and paragraphs in the Urantia book which in one way or another during my past 19 years of reading the book have struck me as funny. Here are some of them. My wife Nancy cautioned me to caution you, however, that most of the things I think are hilarious in the Urantia book <laughs> will probably create no more than an occasional inner smile in the members of this audience whose taste in humor will in all likelihood be rather more dignified than mine. <laughs> Having thus announced the foregoing spousely disclaimer in the public hearing of all, <laughs> I boldly begin, may my wisdom equal my zeal and my courage atone for my ignorance. I find it humorous, for example, that in the story of Andon and Fanta, on page 708, the first big decision ever made by these first two human beings on this planet was the decision to flee. <laughs> Here is a witty word. On 950, we read that primitive man alternated between two potent interests, the passion of getting something for nothing and the fear of getting nothing for something. <laughs> On 1168 is a sentence which has always been funny to me, quote, while the existential paradise trinity is infinite, and while the experiential trinity ultimate is sub-infinite, the trinity absolute is not so easy to classify. <laughs> to which I've always wondered what was so easy about the first two. I find great wit in the description of world religions on page 67. Quote, the Buddhist religion promises salvation from suffering, unending peace. The Jewish religion promises salvation from difficulties, prosperity predicated on righteousness. The Greek religion promised salvation from disharmony, ugliness, by the realization of beauty. Christianity promises salvation from sin, sanctity. Mohammedanism provides deliverance from the rigorous moral standards of Judaism and Christianity. <laughs> Listen to this from 1346. One evening about sundown, before Joseph had returned home, Gabriel appeared to Mary by the side of a low stone table. And listen to this understatement. And after she had recovered her composure, <laughs> It's only a passing phrase, but in fact, one wonders how long it may have taken her to recover her composure. On 1135 is a delightful drollery written by a Melchizedek of Nebadon. Theology is the study of your religion. The study of another's religion is psychology. Sometimes abnormal psychology. In his biography, W.C. Fields, His Follies and Fortunes, Author Robert Louis Taylor relates that when W.C. Fields was a boy in Philadelphia, he helped his father push a vegetable vending cart around town, but continually angered his father by crying out the names of vegetables which were not in the cart, <laughs> but the names of which the boy enjoyed pronouncing. Rutabagas, pomegranates, calabashes, he would yell, and the housewives would flock to his side. I take similar delight in one sentence in the Arantia book on page 694.
Describing the new continental land stage and the evolutionary history of Urantia, the authors write, quote, Soon there were small horses, fleet-footed rhinoceroses, tapers with proboscises, <laughs> primitive pigs, squirrels, lemurs, opossums, and several tribes of monkey-like animals. <laughs> A veritable banquet of orally succulent euphonious verbiage. <laughs> Another dry drollery is this terse sentence on page 852, quote, Adam lived for 530 years. He died of what might be termed old age. <laughs> <laughs> on page 1049, there's a sentence which one could interpret as a classic double entendre, quote, for more than 500 years, the Salem teachers made headway in Iran, and the whole nation was swinging to the Melchizedek religion. <laughs> what a picture that conjures in the mind, a whole nation swinging to the Melchizedek religion. <laughs> On 9.53, we read, The primitive doctrine of survival after death was not necessarily a belief in immortality. Beings who could not count over 20 could hardly conceive of infinity and eternity. <laughs> A classic bit of angelic wit and tongue in wing humor <laughs> is this referring to Andon and Fanta on page 717, quote, they sought to send greetings to Urantia in connection with these revelations, but this request was wisely denied them. <laughs> <laughs> The statement of which fact in the Urantia book, thereby consisting of the conveying of those very greetings. <laughs> <laughs> On page 480, we read that the hypothetical concept of ether in physics represented, quote, an ingenious attempt of man to unify his ignorance. <laughs> On 1143, we read, the Trinity concept of revealed religion must not be confused with the triad beliefs of evolutionary religions. The ideas of triads arose from many suggestive relationships, but chiefly because of the three joints of the fingers, because three legs were the fewest which could stabilize a stool, because three support points could keep up a tent. Furthermore, primitive man for a long time could not count beyond three. <laughs> Listen to this on page 861. Adamson and Ratta had a family of 67 children. They gave origin to a great line of the world's leadership, but they did something more. It should be remembered that both of these beings were really superhuman. Every fourth child born to them was of a unique order. It was often invisible. <laughs> Ratta was greatly perturbed. <laughs> On page 1842, we read of Lazarus and his sisters in Bethany. Quote, and notwithstanding that all three had long been ardent followers of Jesus, they were highly respected by all who knew them. <laughs> Even though they had been followers of Jesus. Right? On page 1999 stands this sentence. From first to last, this is a poignant one. From first to last in his so-called trial before Pilate, the ongoing celestial hosts could not refrain from broadcasting to the universe the depiction of the scene as Pilate on trial before Jesus. One of the most astonishing puns in the Urantia book I found on page 2030 and 2031. On 2030, we read that after the resurrection of Jesus, even though Simon Peter had run to see the empty tomb himself, he later, quote, fell into grave doubting. <laughs> At first, I was quite certain such a pun must undoubtedly have been unintentional, but upon reflection on the context, in spite of the empty tomb and the resurrection, Peter fell into grave doubting. <laughs> the resurrection papers are in fact full of wit and humor. For instance, on page 2034, we read that Cleopas the Elder was a partial believer in Jesus, 
At least he'd been cast out of the synagogue. <laughs> a funny insight into the time perspective of a life carrier is afforded on page 658, where one writes that, quote, one of the moons of Jupiter is now approaching dangerously near the critical zone of tidal disruption. And within a few million years, we'll either be claimed by the planet or we'll undergo gravity tidal disruption. When somebody writes of an event a few million years in the future as being dangerously near, you know he isn't exactly one of us. <laughs> I may well be alone in this viewpoint, but I find it philosophically funny that on page 126 we are told paradise is the geographic center of infinity. I may well be alone. <laughs> <laughs> on page 978 we read it was no empty boast that a certain Egyptian ruler made when he stated that he had sacrificed 113,433 slaves 493,386 head of cattle 88 boats 2,756 golden images 331,702 jars of honey and oil 228,380 jars of wine 680,714 geese, 6,744,428 loaves of bread, and 5,740,352 sacks of coin. Sheer necessity eventually drove these summer savages to eat the material part of the sacrifices the gods having enjoyed the soul there. <laughs> or consider the drollery of this sentence on 893. When the tribal council of the Andite elders had adjudged an inferior captive to be unfit, he was by elaborate ceremony committed to the shaman priests who escorted him to the river and administered the rites of initiation to the happy hunting grounds. <laughs> Lethal submergence. <laughs> On page 388 we read, while the young universe of Nebadon stands low in the scale of universes as regards spiritual achievement and high ethical development, nevertheless, our administrative troubles have so turned the whole universe into a vast clinic for other nearby creations that the Melchizedek colleges are thronged with student visitors and observers from other realms. <laughs> there is cutting wit in this sentence on page 805, exclusive and self-serving profit motivation is incompatible with Christian ideals, much more incompatible with the teachings of Jesus. <laughs> We read on page 976, to those who believe that prosperity and righteousness went together, the apparent prosperity of the wicked occasioned so much worry that it was necessary to invent hells for the punishment of taboo violators. The numbers of these places of future punishment have varied from one to five. The idea of confession and forgiveness early appeared in primitive religion. Men would ask forgiveness at a public meeting for sins they intended to commit the following week. <laughs> On 977, a brilliant evening star of Nebadon, referring to the Apostle Paul's teaching that it is good for a man not to touch a woman, remarks, if the advice of the tent maker teacher were to be literally and universally obeyed, then would the human race come to a sudden and inglorious end. <laughs> On 995, we read that with those mortals who have not been delivered from the primitive bondage of fear, there's a real danger that all prayer may lead to a morbid sense of sin, unjustified convictions of guilt, real or fancied. But in modern times, it is not likely that many will spend sufficient time at prayer to lead to this harmful brooding over their unworthiness <laughs> and sinfulness. <laughs> On page 1006, we read, Religion is the efficient scourge of evolution, which ruthlessly drives indolent and suffering humanity from its natural state of intellectual inertia, forward and upward to the higher levels of reason and wisdom. We read on 1124, Melchizedek's advice on how to deal, this is how to deal with someone who mocks your religious faith. Quote, the God-knowing soul dares to say, I know, even when this knowledge of God is questioned by the unbeliever who denies such a certitude because it is not wholly supported by intellectual logic. To every such doubter, the believer only replies, 
How do you know that I don't know? <laughs> That's how to deal with the scatter. <laughs> now, for those of you who are confused concerning the relationship of science, philosophy, and religion, this issue is cleared up on page 1228, where a solitary messenger of Orlanton writes, quote, In science, the human self observes the material world. Philosophy is the observation of this observation of the material world, Religion, true spiritual experience, is the experiential realization of the cosmic reality of the observation of the observation of all this relative synthesis of the energy materials of time and space. <laughs> For any who were confused about that. <laughs> In the Jesus Papers on 1396, we read the Jesus family, quote, were all unfitted to comprehend their eldest brother's life because their mother had given them to understand that he was destined to become the deliverer of the Jewish people. After they had received from Mary such intimations as family secrets, imagine their confusion when Jesus would make frank denials of all such ideas and intentions. He knew he was not to become the expected Jewish Messiah, and he concluded that it was next to useless to discuss these matters with his mother. He decided to allow her to entertain whatever ideas she might choose, since all he had said in the past had made little or no impression upon her, and he recalled that his father had never been able to say anything that would change her mind either. <laughs> See Mary introducing Jesus at an evident reception centuries later, my son, the creator's son. <laughs> we read of Buddhism on page 1038. Those who believe this philosophy live better lives than many who do not. I remember <laughs> when I first read these words on 153, quote, you have unwittingly read the truth when your eyes rested on the statement, a day is as a thousand years with God, as but a watch in the night. One paradise of one a day is just seven minutes, three and one eighth seconds less than 1,000 years of present Urantia leap year calendar. And I remember thinking I'm gonna get hungry by noon. <laughs> Those curious regarding the factual historic bases of our contemporary mythology concerning the jocular agrarian landlord at that imagined valley whence come our green peas, sweet corn, string beans, and asparagus, will be intrigued to read on 724 that the green race indeed carried strains of the giant order. <laughs> Many of their leaders being eight and nine feet in height. On page 56 we read, nature is a time-space resultant of two cosmic factors. First, the immutability, perfection, and rectitude of paradise deity. Second, Experimental plans, executive blunders, insurrectionary errors, incompleteness of development, and imperfection of wisdom of the extra paradise creatures from highest to lowest. On 639, we read that God's ascending children are carried to paradise by the, quote, rebound momentum of the thought adjusters. <laughs> which is a droll way of wording it. The adjusters come down so far and so fast to indwell us that after they hit Urantia, they collectively ricochet us back to the celestial realms. The rebound momentum. <laughs> On 768, we learned that the stone axe was invented by, quote, a thoughtful endonite who had severely bruised his fist. <laughs> in a serious combat, and who, quote, rediscovered the idea of using a long stick for his arm and a piece of hard flint bound on the end with sinews for his fist, kidneys. <laughs> on 775, we learned that the reason the trading counter came into use among early merchants was to have, quote, a wall wide enough to prevent the traders reaching each other with weapons. On 778, we're told that at first, Dogs only howled, but later on they learned to bark. 
As we read elsewhere, progress is the watchword of the universe. <laughs> On 916, we read, quote, early in social evolution, peculiar and celibate orders of both men and women arose. They were started and maintained by individuals more or less lacking normal sex urge. Their followers, of course, were unaware of this fact. <laughs> They spent a great deal of time sitting around the campfire, gritting their teeth. <laughs> that is with the boys. <laughs> we read on page 958 that, quote, Though the savage credited ghosts with supernatural powers, he hardly conceived of them as having supernatural intelligence. Many tricks and stratagems were practiced in an effort to hoodwink and deceive the ghosts. Civilized man still pins much faith on the hope that an outward manifestation of piety will in some manner deceive even an omniscient deity. We learn on 962 that in earlier times, quote, pretty women were veiled to protect them from the evil eye. Subsequently, many women who desired to be considered beautiful adopted this practice. <laughs> We learn on 968 that saliva was a potent fetish. Devils could be driven out by spitting on a person. For an elder or superior to spit on one was the highest compliment. This is the same paper in which we learn that an umbilical cord set with pearls was mankind's first necklace. We read on 1503 that John the Baptist, quote, had confused ideas about the coming kingdom and its king. The longer he preached, the more confused he became. <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> After Jesus had been put to death, do you remember his first appearance to his apostles? The story is on 2040. Quote, Shortly after 9 o'clock that evening, after the departure of Cleopas and Jacob, while the Alpheus twins comforted Peter, and while Nathaniel remonstrated with Andrew, and as the ten apostles were there assembled in the upper chamber with all the doors bolted for fear of arrest, the master in Morantia form suddenly appeared in the midst of them saying, Peace be upon you. Why are you so frightened when I appear as though you had seen a spirit? <laughs> the doors were bolted. From my vantage point, I consider their reaction quite understandable. Listen to this astonishing sentence spoken by Jesus on 1416. How many of us could get away with this? To the speaker at the forum, he said, Your eloquence is pleasing, your logic is admirable, your voice is pleasant, but your teaching is hardly true. <laughs> Joshua Ben Rickles. <laughs> That's like saying I have some good news and some bad news. First, the good news. Your eloquence, your logic, and voice are excellent. Now the bad news, unfortunately, what you're saying is entirely wrong. But he got away with it because he loved these people so intensely. One of the most philosophically profound sentences in the entire Urantia book is also, to me, funny. It occurs on page 1298. This one sentence, dealing, just one sentence, dealing with the important issue of causation, and I quote, in the presence of the universal absolute, these causative impregnated static potentials forthwith become active and responsive to the influence of certain transcendental agencies whose actions result in the transmutation of these activated potentials to the status of true universe possibilities for development actualized capabilities for growth. <laughs> <laughs> My associate will explain this later. <laughs> On page 1696, we read that after Jesus had tamed a lunatic and coincidentally a herd of about 30 swine ran over a cliff into the sea, a spokesman for the swine herders of the area came and said, Fishermen of Galilee, <laughs> depart from us and take your prophet with you. <laughs> we know he is a holy man. But the gods of our country do not know him, and we stand in danger of losing many swine. <laughs> on 1753, we read that after Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain, quote, the three apostles were so badly frightened that they were slow in collecting their wits. 
But Peter, who was first to recover himself, said as the dazzling vision faded from before them and they observed Jesus standing alone, Jesus, Master, it's good to have been here. We rejoice to see this glory. We are loath to go back down into the inglorious world. If you're willing, let us abide here and we will erect three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And Peter says this, we read, because of his confusion and because nothing else came into his mind at just that moment. <laughs> there is much, much more of wit and humor, things that would have struck me personally as funny in this book, and to seek for these things and to delight in them is one of the joys of studying this fifth ethical revelation, but the supreme joy transcending all other pleasures is the spiritual exhilaration of finding and knowing the infinite God.